Welcome to this latest edition of 100 Earths Remain, a new foreign policy channel on The National, talking about the issues such as Brexit, Gulf issues, as well as trade, investment and military affairs. I'm joined today by Professor Paul James Cardwell. Thank you. Uh, you're the uh, Professor of Law at Strathclyde University. Um, you've also uh, been at Sheffield. Tell us a bit about your history. Well, I'm an academic in law. Uh, I have a background in law and political science, and my particular area of interest is the external relations of the EU. So I started my career working on EU-Japan relations and moved on to uh, the Mediterranean region uh, and also the importance of migration. Uh, in my research and my teaching, I do also focus on the commercial relations uh, of the EU. And most recently, of course, I've been looking at Brexit and its uh, implications for the UK, the EU and the rest of the world. I mean, yeah, that's absolutely why I wanted to, to talk to you. You're, you're one of the uh, hated experts <laughs> <laughs> that, that the new wave of populism um, so detests. But I can, I can uh, definitely ascertain for our audience that you're not detestable in any way. Thank you. Um, uh, of course, we're, we're going to be focusing uh, in this episode on sort of EU, UK, Japan relations in terms of trade. Uh, so the first question that I wanted to cover was looking at sort of the chances of a quick trade deal. The UK government, uh, Department for International Trade, Liam Fox, is still pushing this notion that actually the, the trade we have with the EU can still be totally uh, recouped when we look at countries outside Europe. I mean, what do you say in terms of uh, Japanese expectations and the UK's chance. Well, Japan, of course, is one of the most important countries economically uh, in the world. And it's mm. one of the world's largest economies, so you would expect a UK government and, of course, the EU institutions to pursue opportunities with, uh, with Japan. I think one of the problems here, um, and it's in the terms of which you highlighted there, is this notion of a quick trade deal. These simply don't happen. Mm -hmm. Any mention of a quick trade deal, for me, is, is an alarm bell ringing because in reality they take years to resolve. Now the UK, sorry, the EU doesn't currently have a free trade deal and, and also that's a slightly problematic term. I think we often assume that it's wider than it actually is. Um, with Japan, uh, it's on the cards, it's been developing over many, many years and Japan is a really good case study of how parties, no matter how large the economy, do need a long, long time to really get to know each other uh, and to really start to resolve those issues that they have. Free trade isn't just about dropping barriers and things like that. It's also about all these non-tariff barriers. It's also about you know, regulatory convergence and so on. And they're all kind of political, domestic political issues as well that mm -hmm. we have in the UK, that other member states around the EU, and of course they have in third countries such as Japan. Well, you know, the UK government would point to uh, sort of the Aston Martin deal, it's a £500 million deal that was announced uh, during Theresa May's three-day visit to Japan. I mean, they would say that uh, uh, people who are sceptical of a quick trade deal uh, or any kind of free trade deal uh, are being pessimistic. And actually, that Aston Martin deal is a clear sign mm -hmm. of progress. Yes, and certainly, I mean, we shouldn't look at every single sign as being one which leads on necessarily to large-scale deals right across right across the board. I mean, this is certainly good news for the, for the UK and the UK car industry and so on. But I think the problem here is that so much is dependent on other factors. So a future trade deal between the UK and Japan is also dependent on a future deal between Japan and the EU, which is still very much developing. It's, it seems to have ratcheted up a notch, but it has, as I mentioned before, because it's, it's been going on for about eight, nine years. That's so. right, yeah. And that's only the, the sort of formal stage, but the informal stage, you know, goes back sort of 20 years or so um, and also just the nature of the way in which these things work and particularly in the context of Brexit means that much depends on the UK's relationship with the EU as well so it's almost like having a lot of dominoes uh, set up and you take one away and then they're not all going to fall down uh, and they need to be of course in the, in the correct sequence and so I think that's one of the, the main problems that we have in, in trying to ascertain well what can the UK do um, after, after Brexit vis-a-vis -vis third countries such as Japan. 
Am I right in assuming that the EU has that built-in advantage because it can negotiate at least behind the scenes with non-European countries, whereas the UK can't necessarily do that unless it completes a divorce? Mm. Or is, is the EU itself hampered in terms of how far it can negotiate with India or how far it can continue trade negotiations with Japan? Well, the EU has what we call exclusive competence. So under the, commercial, the common commercial policy, it's written in the treaty, and the treaty is written by the member states of mm -hmm. the UK agreed to this and has always been supportive of this. So the EU doesn't negotiate behind the scenes. I mean, they've closed negotiations and so on, but the position papers are there and so on. And so they are in a continual process of negotiation with countries like, say, India, Japan, countries all over the world. Mm -hmm. The UK can't do that because the treaty prevents it from doing so. But as I said, the UK was one of the member states who wrote the treaty, signed it, and has amended it when it's been the Treaty of Lisbon and so on as well, and yeah. the UK has always been supportive of it. The reason why member states can't do their own trade deals is simply that it would undermine the single market. So if you had a, a good deal with another country, but because we don't have barriers to goods within the EU, then that means that a member state that has a separate trade deal, the goods could come into that country and then they're they can go elsewhere in the EU, so it simply wouldn't work. So the fact that we have this state of affairs is, is actually a logical counterpart to the single market um, itself. Now, yes, you're right that the UK can't negotiate because that would be breaching the treaties, and the government has said, no, we will uphold the law whilst we are still a member of the EU. Of course, there's nothing to prevent the UK and, and doing what Liam Fox has been doing in trying to, to set up future trade deals. I mean, I think that's that's a logical thing and that's what we would expect a UK government minister to be doing to to start to prepare um, but as I said because of all the other things that are going on in terms of the relationship with the EU and, and again in the case of Japan because its own um, agreement with the EU is still developing um, it's difficult to get anything more than just signals that uh, this can be put in place once the UK uh, leaves. What about the theory that the UK completes its divorce um, with the EU, and because it is a single nation, uh, it doesn't really matter about all this groundwork that's been laid by the EU as a collection of member states. It will speed on through a complete deal with sort of the two countries that we've we've um, we've focused on, uh, India and Japan, and actually the EU will be lumbering on and, and still negotiating with Japan and India while this while while the UK actually speeds ahead. And what's your argument about the idea of sort of a collection of member states always being slow and laborious? Mm. I mean, yeah, one of the criticisms of the EU is is just that that it is because it's made up of numerous member states, all with different interests, means that you know, blockages can, can come along as well because of domestic politics, which might have nothing to do with mm -hmm. the grander scheme. India is a good example, of course, where we know, uh, and it's been clear from the government there, that re, uh, the migration of highly skilled individuals is something that they would want in exchange for access to its considerable market of over a billion people. And of course, it was the UK, and particularly Theresa May at the Home Office, that was uh, very much against that. Okay. So the UK is going to come up against the same uh, problems. Again, there's a bit of an assumption, I think, though, that the EU is necessarily slow and cumbersome because it's got so many member states mm -hmm. in it. That goes yes so far, and of course, you know, we found, we saw with the agreement with Canada that uh, it was held up by a regional parliament in yeah. Belgium um, <laughs> blocking it. Um, but on the other hand, even when you look at two states outside the EU who are negotiating a deal, so for example Canada and South Korea, there the agreement also took eight, nine years as well. So it's not necessarily just a, a problem um, of the European Union. So the idea that the UK can somehow do this much more quickly uh, is problematic for, for a number of reasons, partly because it's that's the international norm, also because the UK simply doesn't have the staff because it's never needed to do these kind of negotiations over years. So there are talented British people doing this work. Many, of course, will work for the European institutions or, or elsewhere. So trying to tempt back in people from private practice and, uh, and so on as well is a difficult and uh, potentially very expensive thing um, to do. Uh, but also in terms of, well, what's in the UK's interest? Now, it might be goods. But of course the UK economy also relies on services and that's very, very difficult um, because generally speaking the, the law and the international law on services is much less developed than it might be on, on goods. Yeah. So that only goes so far in really helping. 
Of course, there's another argument about, well, are trade deals actually even necessary? Um, I think we've, we've tended to fall into this assumption that we need these, you know, huge free trade deals. But as I said, one of the problems about talking about free trade deals is that we assume they're open to everything, and actually they're not. They're generally very, very complex and only in, um, in, in sectoral areas. So the overall benefit might not be the quite big bang that we are um, expecting. Um, but certainly we can see from um, the recent launch of the, the Canada-EU um, deal, and certainly British government departments were you know, promoting the opportunities of this to, to British businesses, but of course that only lasts so long as we're in a member state of the EU. Okay. So the final question that I wanted to ask was, uh, how do you think uh, a possible sort of UK-US Atlantic Bridge kind of treaty uh, would affect the UK's already declining relationship with Europe and also with uh, non-European countries as well. I mean, is it a case, is there a zero-sum game of an increased Atlantic cooperation means inevitably that, that those sense of bonds, connections, opportunities for trade will sort of immediately or precipitously decline over the, over the next sort of 20 years? Mm. I think almost the, the, same, the same logic applies. I mean, if the UK wants to enhance cooperation with the US in, in economic terms, then it's going to come up against some pretty problematic um, issues. And, and also in terms of regulation and so on as well, will that be compatible with any agreement that there is with the rest of the EU? Um, how open is the US going to be? And particularly, again, going back to the question of services and so on as well, and that's before we've even got on to the sort of chlorinated chicken um, things, which has become, you know, a sort of core celebra um, in the thing. So it's really uh, trying to see how the jigsaw all, all fits together. And the problem that we have at the moment is, you know, the clock is ticking. The EU exit is coming because two years after uh, the launch of Article 50 or the notification of Article 50, the UK leaves the EU unless... There's an extension which has to be agreed by all EU member states, all other EU member states, um, or the UK government tries to retract um, and uh, somehow take back uh, its Article 50, which there is discussion in legal circles about whether that is in fact uh, possible to, to do without the say-so of the other member states or perhaps the, the, the Court of Justice. So really to try and look for a kind of a, a sort of saviour agreement I think is very, very uh, problematic and really everything depends on the extent to which the UK and the EU conclude a deal. Um, but if we don't uh, find that there is a, you know, a, a deal or you know, going forward after that, a transition deal and so on, then, you know, there really is, you know, huge economic problems, but also legal ones um, as well. Um, and I think the danger is then trying to rush into quick deals as quickly as possible. We know generally that law which is made quickly tends not to be very good law, and I think mm -hmm. the same is also true of commercial deals, just to try and show that they are happening, uh, because the risk is there. You can find, uh, you know, things being signed away that actually, you know, may risk, such as, you know, uh, NHS um, uh, services and so on. The, the theory yeah. is that if the economy relies on on the idea of com of confidence mm. and the, the confidence trick, that you know, markets go up, markets go down based on a sort of feeling in the ether. Then maybe you know the odd deal here and there is a good thing. Maybe, maybe so. Uh, yes, but I think you know it's it's just this idea that things can be done quickly. Mm. Um, I think uh, is. is it's very problematic um, and that's one of the things that I'd certainly argue against quite aside from the merits of you know whether trade deals are actually good for the UK economy once it's outside of the uh, the EU um, but certainly it's this notion that you know quick is, is is good and that because as a member state well we're already part of the negotiation therefore it can just quickly be adapted you have no control over what the third country itself might think it may be a different government in time uh, mm. when the UK is, is negotiating from when the agreement with the EU was, was put in place. They might not be favourable to, uh, to the same type of agreement with the UK as with the EU, and that's something over which the UK will have no control at all. Thank you very much. You're welcome.